says, I'm a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. On one hand, slave, that, that term for slave is just this lowest, most menial person. No rights, no property, owns nothing, only serves at his master's will, makes no decisions for himself. And yet, on the other hand, it's also the most exalted position to be the servant of the Most High God. There's no greater caller that, calling than that. And so somewhere between the lowest to the highest is where we live. When we look at that term bondservant in James 1.1, 1, 1, there's a couple of different words in the Greek that we use for, that we translate as, as servant. One is diakonos, which is transliterated to deacon. You know that one. It's also translated as minister and sometimes as servant. But the one in James is dolos, translated as servant or bondservant or slave. We see it all over the place. 127 times that word is used in the New Testament. By the way, if you want to check me on my references, etc., in the back there's a whole pile of papers that are my notes that I use when I prepare. So if you're really into scrutinizing everything I said and make sure I got it right, the information you need is back there. You can check me out on that. Um, it is 127. You'll see them all listed there, and you can go look them up for yourself. Not that I did. To be honest, I did not look at all 127 of those passages. But I did look at a few, ones that helped to contrast the difference between diakonos and doulos. In Matthew 20, 26, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him first be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. The first part, let him be your servant, diakonos. The last part, let him be your slave, dolos. Clearly, there's a distinction between these two things. One is lower than the other. In Colossians 4, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. And again, there seems to be a distinction between faithful minister, diakonos, and fellow servant, dolos. There's many forms of servanthood, many forms of slavery. In, um, in the Greek society, there were those that were captured by, in war and placed into slavery. That's uh, andropodon, or something like that. My Greek's no good, but there's a different word for that. So it's not that. But dolos is used to describe one born as a slave, somebody who enters slave by choice, someone whose family has sold them into slavery, someone who's been sold into slavery to pay off a debt, all of those things. And the idea is that it's a person who's going to spend a lifetime in complete servitude. No rights, no property, no freedom, only doing their master's will. John MacArthur um, says... Dolos is one born as a slave. And, and it's the idea of uh, involuntary permanent serv uh, service. I kind of disagree with him in that one because in the epistles, Paul, Peter, and James elevate that term to, to kind of the level that the Hebrew ebed is that we see in, in um, Exodus 21. And we're going to go to Exodus 21 and look at a passage there. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures... The word that they use in this passage is dolos, the idea of slave. And in, Matthew, in Exodus 21, it says, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says... I love my master, my wife, and my children. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. The idea is, given the choice to be free, this servant says, I don't want to be free. I love my master's house. I want to stay here. And so publicly, they go to the priest and they say, look, he said he doesn't want to be free. He wants to say, stay. They pierce his ear, bore a hole through it with an awl. 
the sign of the slave, and he remains as a slave in his house forever. Even if he wanted to, he can't walk away now. He belongs in his master's house. First, we've got to realize that we're all slaves to something. One thing or another, we're slaves. Some claim to be their own masters, but when you look at it, they're slaves to money or material things. They're slaves to pleasure or lust. And these are harsh masters. It may look like you're getting ahead. It may look like you have all the power and prestige you want. It may look like you're having a great time living life to the fullest. You have everything you want, but there's always a penalty to pay. No peace, no life. Payment in full is always required. You never get your money's worth when it comes to chasing after material things, chasing after pleasure. Sooner or later, relationships are destroyed, families driven away, your friendships are shallow. You have no connection to anything that's real, anything that's alive. And that's what being a slave to sin, a slave to your own passions, is about. In Romans 6, starting in verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he has died, has been freed from sin. Is a recognition that we are sold into slavery, to the slavery of sin, that sin is our master, and that no matter what we do, we can't get away from him. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have two masters. It's one way or the other. You're serving self and sin, or you're serving the God of life. It's all in time. Amber said, uh, saying about being free from the burden of, the, of sin, and we see that so well in Romans chapter 6. I read a little bit at the beginning of the passage, but down in, in verse 15 and following, it says, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that through you, oh, sorry, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then and the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. When you're a slave to sin, yes, you can have money and power and prestige. Yes, you can indulge every whim of the body. But what does it gain you? Because in the end, it's death. But as a slave to God, you gain the greatest gift an eternity of life with our Creator, with our loving God. Every genuine servant of God is one who would not go out, who would not accept liberty even if it were offered, which it is daily. Every day you're offered your liberty in the form of temptations. You have free will. But a genuine servant of God is not going to go out from his master's house because he's chosen to have his ear pierced by God at the doorpost. He's chosen to become a slave of God. There are different alls that fix our ear to the doorpost. It, talks, it gives that picture. You take your servant to the doorpost, and you fix his ear to the doorpost with an all. One of them is his mercy in the past. One of the reasons that we become slaves of God is because of what he's done for us. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, 
which are God's. The power in the blood that Amber and her girl sang of, that's the price. You were bought with a huge price. God became flesh, walked around among us, died for us. In Philippians, it talks about how he gave up his godness to become a slave, being found in human likeness. An incredible price was paid. In 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Referring to manumission, this, this idea of buying a slave out of bondage, it wasn't done with gold or silver. It was done with the very blood of Christ. An incredible gift. And that pierces our ear. That opens it up as we are enslaved to a God that loved us so much to show us his mercy. And that while we were so far from him in our sin, he came to us and said, I want you. I'm willing to pay the price to redeem you. Another all that pierces our ear to the doorpost is our helplessness on our own. Jesus turns to the 12 after doing all the miracles, feeding the 5,000, he's walked on the water, and, and he's teaching them hard things. And he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And a little later, he turns to the 12 because people are going away from him. They're deserting him. And Jesus says, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Where else, else are we going to go except to God to receive the words of life? How are we going to live here? How are we going to make it from day to day without our God? Once having tasted that, once having felt his presence in your life, how would you ever walk away from that? So again, we're enslaved to our God. There's also our hope of eternity in our future. We look forward to something. It says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. It says, Well done, you good and faithful servant. And we stay obedient to our God, remain enslaved to our Creator God, and hope and expectation of hearing that, well done, you good and faithful servant. It goes on later in that chapter in Matthew 25, down toward the end, it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the very beginning, it was his plan that we would inherit the kingdom that he's prepared for us. And even though we haven't done anything to deserve it, even though there's no great merit in us, it's still there for us and our hope for eternity in our future pierces our ear to the doorpost. Again, that passage in Romans 6 says, when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things that, of which you are now ashamed? For the ends of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. See, that's the end, everlasting life. Not everlasting separation, not the death that enslavement to sin brings, 
but everlasting life in the presence of God that enslavement to our Heavenly Father brings. Another all that pierces our ear is the joy of salvation in the present. Did I get those out of order? I think your notes had them in the opposite order. Okay, so if you were worried about that blank you didn't get to fill out, here it is. The joy of our salvation in the present. Okay. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. It's tough when you memorize things in different translations and then you try to use uh, one that you're not familiar with. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience is how I know that one. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's for now. That's not for some future time. As a servant of my God, as one who's chosen to have his ear pierced at the doorpost, those are the things that enrich my life now, by the power of his spirit in my life, now. See, it's not just some future time. It's not some way off distance when I die and go to heaven, I get to be with God and life is great. Right now, I get to be in the presence of my God. Right now, I can receive his spirit in my life. Right now, I can have love, joy, peace used to wrestle with that all the time. My mom was so much into Southern gospel music. No offense to anyone. Okay, I've done my time. I've been to Urbana. I've been to the All, all Night Sings. I've done those things. Um, and, and I love those people. But in their music, so much is dedicated to this, when I die and go to heaven, when I reach sweet Beulah land, when I'm standing on those shores, which is all great, but I don't want to wait till then. I want it now, and that's what we can have. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. And because of the joy of our salvation in the present, we remain affixed to the doorpost as servants of God. So what then is our response? What does this mean? None of this stuff matters till you do something with it. So what do we do with this? Um, I'm going to tell you what I did with it, and I'm not asking you to do this, okay? This is just personal illustration. From there, you probably see a little gleam of gold here. I have my ear pierced. Yeah, that's not normal in a Southern Baptist preacher. I'll admit that. In fact, it got me in a lot of trouble several times, but that's okay. See, when I read James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, doing my normal Bible study and reading the cross-references, and it took me to Exodus chapter 21 and Deuteronomy 15, where it gives that passage about piercing the ear, and I will never go out of my master's house. I want to stay here. Guess what that means? That's what that's about. See, I grew up in the church. I accepted Christ when I was five years old. I was baptized when I was eight years old in Potts's Pond, I remember, it was uh, spring, it was in upstate New York, it was cold, it was cold, cold. And before we were baptized, there was a whole bunch of us, maybe 30 of us, and we had to uh, make a public testimony before we were baptized. And at eight years old, I said, I love the Lord with all my heart and I want to follow him forever. That was my public statement before I was baptized. And then again at 14, Dr. Reynolds, down at Bayshore Baptist, where I was a teenager, the first church I was baptized in was the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. That wasn't good enough for him. So I had to be baptized as a Southern Baptist. And I did that. It was okay. But even though I'd made those commitments, just like everybody else, I'm prone to wander. I messed things up. I did high school and graduated high school and went off to college and entered workforce and spent a lot of time wandering around kind of aimless, aimlessly. And there was a point when I was 26 years old. And I'm studying James and this passage, and it dawns on me. My master's been good to me. He's given me a wife, and he's given me children, or a child at that time. 
I want to stay in my master's house forever. I don't ever want to go out from this place. So that's what this is about. That's why it's there. Someday I'll bring you a sermon called The Parable of the Earring because there's a lot of good stuff that goes with that. Guys, you may not know this, but there's a lot of stuff you have to do to keep a, a, a pierced ear clean and not get infected. And I had a lot of tough lessons to learn, just like we do in our Christian lives. It's a lot of tough, question, uh, tough, tough things to learn about keeping your commitment pure, about staying the course, about being a true, obedient slave of our master. So, what's your response? I'm not expecting to see a line at Piercing Pagoda, okay? It's all right. You don't have to do that. But for the church folk, in Luke 17, it says, Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and after you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. See, we've received such a great love. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we might be called children of God. Where's the passage in Romans Romans 8? The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God, and of children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's a slavery that calls us to be heirs with Christ. It's a slavery which calls us to greater service. It's a slavery that calls us to be children of God. Why would you not pursue that? Why, not, why would that not be worth everything? To pursue God with all. Talked about piercing my ear. Might as well talk about poker too. Might as well get it all out here. So, uh, there's a game in poker, Texas, Texas River Poker, and it's made popular on you know, different channels, and they have these big World Series of poker tournaments, and you watch these guys sitting around the table, and they're gambling and so forth. And at one point or another, everybody gets to the point where they push all their chips into the middle of the table, and they say, I'm all in. And that's win big or go home time. It's all or nothing. That's what this is about. It's all or nothing. It's a service of God that consumes everything. Are you all in? For people that are kind of in between and not quite sure about all this talk about being a slave of God and piercing your ear and you know, driving it all through your ear at a doorpost, Let's look at another passage. In Joshua 24, starting in verse 14, it says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. See, the gods of this world are really harsh taskmasters. They're tough. And you can go about thinking that you've got the world by the tail and that you can depend on yourself and that you can have the car and have the wife and have the boat, have the job, have the power, have the prestige. This is a very high price to pay for that. The self-absorbed life is a hollow, shallow, empty life. You have an opportunity to choose this day who will you serve. You serve sin, which ultimately leads to death and destruction. Or will you choose, choose to serve the God of life? 
Come home to the master of love. John says, behold what manner of love has been given us that we might be called sons of God. That idea that we are God's children, adopted children, by choice. He came and claimed us. Why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you let him fill your life with the love, joy, and peace that he wants for us? See, it's a slavery to a God that only wants what's very best for you. It's a slavery to a life that's full of fulfillment and peace and love and joy. It's a slavery to a people of God that are true family. Why wouldn't you want that? I think at the end of your sermon hand, handout, if I remembered it, to put it in there, you have a, a prayer from C.H. Spurgeon. Um, when he preached from Exodus chapter 20, that passage on slavery, this is the prayer he used when he closed that time. I'm going to want to pray that for us now. In a moment, I'm going to pray that prayer. I've never done this service before. Do we have a, a hymn of commitment? Good, thank you. I should have read the bulletin. I'm sure it's in there. In a moment, after I've prayed this prayer, we're going to have a a hymn of commitment. And a lot of things can happen to that at at that time. You can come forward for prayer. We would love to pray pray with you and for you. You could come forward to unite with this church. Saying, hey, I want to be a part of these believers here. We would love to have you. You can also come forward to have your ear pierced at the doorpost, to enter into the house of God, to stay forever with the God that loves you. Let's pray together. Lord, while I live until I die, I desire to be thy servant to the utmost of my power. I desire to do thy will or to suffer it. I give myself up without reserve or limitation. All that I am, all that I have, I give up to thee. Take me, from this day forth, and let me not offer this prayer as a mere matter of form or hypocrisy, but may I offer it heartily and from my inmost soul. Enable me to say, I am thy servant. O God, sanctify me, spirit, soul, and body, for thy name's sake. Amen. The altar is open for you at this time. If you'd please rise. If you'd like to unite with this church, I invite you to come forward. If you'd like to talk to somebody about having Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your your life, I'd love to talk to you. If you just need time to pray at the altar, we'd love to pray with you. This time is for you. We'll be singing hymn number 596, I Surrender.
Thank you for your time this morning. And as we leave here today, I pray that you would find that life surrendered to God, forsaking all those things that don't bring life and embracing his life so that people can see in you a love, a joy, a peace, a patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control that they want in their life. I can see God living in you. Father, as we exit here today, as we go about our business, I pray that you'd bring us in contact with people that need you and that they would see you in our lives and desire that above all else. Father, help us to bring light to dark places, warmth to the coldness, joy to the sorrow. Help us to be your ambassadors, your ministers of reconciliation. In Christ's name I pray, amen.